so good. So we're ready to continue on. And so this uh, this is a little bit of a catch-all at, uh, at this point because we've gotten through almost everything in the creed and we're down to just the last little bit. And this is the part after we say we believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And then the last part of the creed says, and I believe in the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and life everlasting, amen. So we're doing just the, that last part, but as you might imagine, it's, there's a little bit to say about each of those things. So we'll finish off the creed with just a few comments about each of those different things that we mentioned. So among the things that are talked about in the creed, and, and remember the creed comes, there's the Apostles' Creed coming all the way from the first century, and then what we use on Sunday is sometimes the Nicene Creed, um, from the Council of Nicaea from the 4th century. It's a little bit longer, it's a more developed creed. But the fact that it was a creed means that it was a synthesis of what was considered to be some of the most important um, beliefs of the faith. So we're, we're talking about something that's fundamental. We'd say, well, you know, aren't there lots of things that the church teaches and that we believe? Well, that's true, but here we can say from the early days of the church, here are these critical things. So we talk about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We talk about the church. And then after that, we mention these, uh, these three things, the first of which is the forgiveness of sins. So let's say a little bit about the forgiveness of sins. The, uh, there are a couple different times in the Gospels when the forgiveness of sins really comes up and it is a really fundamental thing. And if you think about the work of salvation, Jesus came to save us. Well, sin is one of the great obstacles between us and God. And so if Jesus is going to save us, it's going to be by forgiving sin. So it, it makes sense that it would be a fundamental theme that would, uh, that would come up and be part of Jesus' work. Um, in John's Gospel, toward the end, uh, after he appears in the resurrection, he breathes on the disciples. He says, receive the Holy Spirit, and whose sins you forgive are forgiven. So the, he even speaks specifically about the power to forgive sins that's granted to the apostles. At the end of Mark's gospel, Jesus tells all the apostles, he says, go out into all the world and preach the gospel. He who believes in it and is baptized will be saved. And that idea of being saved, saved from what? Saved from sin. So, and that can only happen if sin can be forgiven. So just two quick examples. And uh, <clears throat> there are other moments when Jesus mentions the idea of forgiveness of sins. Um, the, uh, and so it, it is definitely attested to in the Gospels. Um, and so then we get to the question, well, how are sins forgiven? And there are really two important ways. One was mentioned in that passage I just mentioned at the end of Mark. It says, he who is baptized, who is believes and is baptized will be saved. Baptism. So there's one of the ways in which sin is forgiven. We know baptism forgives all sin. When we come back after Thanksgiving and we get more into more detail about baptism, then we'll, we'll get more specific about that. But for right now, it's enough just to say that baptism is a sacrament that inserts us into Jesus Christ and forgives us of all sin. So all sin is forgiven in baptism, original sin from Adam and Eve, any actual sins we've committed, any consequences of sins that we've committed, it's all washed clean in baptism. That sounds like a really good deal. Two problems. Number one, you can only be baptized once. So, that, okay, so that, it's really good at the moment, but you can't receive it a second time. And so baptism is, a, is, a, um, is an unrepeatable sacrament. So that's not much help because what happens if we sin after we've been baptized? Now we're, now we're in real trouble. Um, but the other problem with baptism, and it's not really so much a problem with baptism, but it's just a, it's a reality that we have, is if you remember when we talked about sin, we said one of the effects of sin was concupiscence, which is that desire. It means that the, the order that we had when we were created and made to be good has now been corrupted such that we sense within us sometimes a desire to sin. We feel sometimes the, the allure of sin or the attraction to sin. And the problem with baptism is while the sins are washed away, unfortunately the weakness of our fallen human nature is not remedied in baptism. We still sense within us that human weakness that can sometimes lead us to sin. So baptism is great in that it begins our relationship with Christ and washes us of all sins, but the problem is we still remain weak and with baptism cannot be repeated. So how do we receive the forgiveness of sins for anything that we might commit after being baptized. And that's where the second answer comes in. If the first answer is that we receive the forgiveness of sins in baptism, well then the second answer is through penance, or what is sometimes also called reconciliation, 
or what is also sometimes called confession. So confession, penance, or reconciliation, all three words that sometimes can be used interchangeably to refer to a, a different sacrament, the sacrament of confession, there is the opportunity to receive the forgiveness of sins after the baptism, and that's because of what's referred to as the power of the keys. So when uh, Jesus spoke to Peter, he says, I give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Um, from Matthew 16, so that Peter can, in fact, loose the, the obligations or the bonds of sin. They can, a person can be set free. Peter was given this authority. All of the apostles received the Holy Spirit. Jesus gave them the authority. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them. And then, as we would understand that from the, the apostles to their successors, the bishops, and then even to priests. So from the pope to bishops and then to priests comes the power for the forgiveness of sins. Um, thanks be to God for that. That's a great gift. Uh, we just had first confession um, earlier last week for our school children in the St. Thomas grade school. And then just tonight for the kids in the CCD. P kids are in um, the parish but go to public school. And in each case, we try to encourage the adults to come, too. That's the, that's the great time. The kids get ready to come. Tell the adults, you can come, too. Um, and, uh, and sometimes people get really nervous about going to confession, but it's actually something that is very reassuring, um, the, the ability to be forgiven and to know that one is forgiven. That actually brings about a lot of peace and joy. So and tell the adults, don't get nervous. Um, remember of the, the joy that, we'll, that you will have. So there's sometimes anxiety before, but great peace and tranquility after. So that's just a brief kind of comment about the forgiveness of sins with more to come when we get on to the sacraments themselves of baptism and reconciliation. So then we come back to the creed, and in addition to the forgiveness of sins, we say we believe in the resurrection of the body. And this is one, I think when I was talking about Jesus' resurrection, um, so this is maybe one of those that's uh, worth a little time because maybe it can be misunderstood or, or disputed. Um, so what exactly happens? What happened to Jesus when he was raised up, when his body uh, was raised up, and then what will, happen, what will happen to us? So one of the things that we say, this is the fundamental basis for this part of the creed, is that Jesus Christ was truly risen from the dead. So he, he died his body was buried, and he was risen in his, in his body. Um, and the reason why that becomes fundamental is because we also talk about ourselves being incorporated into the body of Christ. That was one of the images we used when we talked last time about the church. So if we're part of his body, if he's raised, then we must also be raised. Um, and uh, there are different passages, in, like John 6, when Jesus talks about the bread of life, he says that whoever the Father gives to me um, cannot be snatched out of my hand, and I will raise him up on the last day. So what does Jesus mean by that? Well, it's, I think we would say that that's a reference to the resurrection. I will raise him up on the last day. So our resurrection would happen at the end, at the, at the very last day. Um, St. Paul says to the Corinthians, he has a, a very famous passage. He says, if, how can you say there's no resurrection from the dead? If, there is no res if the dead are not raised, then Christ was not raised. And if Christ was not raised, then you're still in your sins and your faith is in vain. So it's he's from St. Paul and he, he has kind of a very exasperated section where he's really kind of throttling the Corinthians to say, no, this is, this is absolutely true. We do believe that Christ is raised and therefore your sins have in fact been overcome. And you also who are part of his body will also share in the resurrection just as the head so also the rest of the body will follow. So Jesus has been raised from the dead, and so the same is true for us. That part of being human, so Jesus, when he assumed humanity, our humanity, so a, a human being is body and soul. And we say that those two things, those are really, um, that's constitutive of being human. It's at its fundamental core. We are physical beings, um, visible physical beings, united with an invisible and immortal soul. What happens at death? The soul separates from the body. The body remains here below and is subject to corruption. The soul is immortal and then moves on. But, it's, but that separation is, you might say, well, that we're incomplete without the body. We were meant to be body and soul. And so at the end, on the last day, when the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised, this is St. Paul as he's, as he's talking to the 
Thessalonians, I believe, is where that passage comes from. So then he talks about the dead shall be raised up incorruptible. So what happens to the body here below? It undergoes corruption. So somehow the body is raised and the body is raised up incorrupt. How will that happen? We don't exactly know. So this is, this is part of the mystery that's there. In, in Jesus Christ, we can say that when he was raised from the dead, so on the third day when he rose, so Jesus' human uh, soul, um, so his divine nature and, his, and including his human soul, re-entered his body. And so his body was then, then came back to life. The breath of life came back into the body. It is the same body. And yet at the same time, it's not. It's because it's been changed or transformed. Jesus' resurrected body is um, now somehow different. He's not, he cannot no longer experience any pain. Um, he was able to pass through locked doors. We have that in, the, in some of the resurrection accounts. So Jesus can kind of come and go as he wishes. So he's no longer limited in the way that we would normally think of the body being limited. So for us, when we think of the resurrected body, when we were, or will be raised on the last day, so we too also at that point will be raised up, but no longer subject to corruption. So no longer um, with the body subject to pain or suffering, dependent upon food, um, it, the, uh, no longer limited in a, in a physical sense. So um, I know that's kind of hard to wrap our minds around and then you say, well, how exactly does that happen? And my answer is I don't know, because there's not, we don't have a way to, we don't have a way to, clear, to clearly articulate um, the, these precise details, especially when a person says, well, what about those people who have died a long time ago and there's barely anything of their body left at all? What do you, when, how will they be raised up? What happens if a person's been cremated and then what happens, how will they be raised up? I says, well, we don't know exactly how that will happen, except that we say that the, the, the dead will be raised. So, and that's, that's unequivocal in scripture. So there's a lot there that's kind of hard to wrap our minds around. It, there's a passage, um, if you remember, the Sadducees come up to Jesus, and the, and the gospel makes the point that the Sadducees and the Pharisees are two different groups of people. The Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection, but the Pharisees, they do believe in the resurrection, and so, they, so there are differences between them. And so the Sadducees, they try to trick Jesus by telling a story. They say, well, here's a man, and Moses says that if the man dies without having any children, then his brother should take his wife and raise up children as heirs for him. And they, So here's the story, Jesus. So there are seven brothers, and every, all, all of them were married to this woman, and they all died, and none of them had any children. Whose wife will she be? when they are raised from the dead. And their, their thought behind that is, aha, we've got you. It's a trick question. You, can, you can't possibly answer that question, Jesus. And, and, but the reason why um, they're mistaken in their question is because they were thinking that the resurrection is just you rise from the dead and you go back to be exactly as you are now, meaning that there's no change. Jesus says, no, you don't understand what you're talking about. And, uh, and so he speaks about different passages um, from Scripture and saying that God is God of the living, not God of the dead. Um, and that when we're raised up, then we will no longer um, be as we are, but that we will be like the angels in heaven is the, is the passage that is described there. So somehow this resurrected body will be the same body and at the same time a transformed body. Um, and so that's, um, and I think that's part of what makes this kind of um, a, a difficult a difficult passage to completely understand um, and yet at the same time we do believe that we would will retrieve the body and that's a reason for us to show respect for the body we believe in the dignity of the body um, whenever there's a funeral we always encourage people to make sure that the mortal remains even if it's cremated even the cremated remains are always treated with dignity and reverence um, as the body which has been in life a temple of the Holy Spirit it should be treated with dignity and given um, a final resting place. So we, sometimes that's more difficult with cremation, but we, I do always raise the question and try to push the, uh, the families, if at all possible, to make sure that there is a final resting place. So don't, don't, don't take grandma around with you on a tour. Okay, that's right. Okay, no, give it, let her be at peace. Let her rest in peace. So requiescat in pace, they say. So rest in peace. So rest in peace in a final resting place. Um, it also reminds us um, that although the body has dignity, we do recognize that death is a part of our human experience. 
So yes, the body is meant to undergo corruption when the soul departs from the body. Um, it does remind us that time is short. It's part of the consequences of sin, and so it does mean that we want to be respectful of the body, mindful of the body, but also be prepared for the moment of our death. And we ask the Lord to prepare us for the hour of death. Um, so uh, pray for us, uh, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us now and in the hour of our death. We want the, the saints to pray for us at that time. Uh, but in Jesus Christ, death is not automatically now a negative. Before, death would always, I think, be seen as, as somehow a negative. But St. Paul then says, well, I'm torn because death for me means Christ. So I long to um, go home to the Lord. So he speaks about death now that Jesus Christ has conquered death. St. Paul can speak about death actually as something that almost becomes a kind of a reward. He's waiting for the moment at which he will go to be with the Lord. So death in Jesus Christ has a kind of, it's been redefined. It's not automatically a negative. There is a positive element to death because um, Jesus died. And when we die, we are in union with him. So we, we go to be with him and we pass in union with him even through the process of dying. Death becomes the end of our earthly pilgrimage. So we spend that time and uh, we, prepare, uh, we prepare ourselves and we want to be as ready as we can be to go home to the Lord. Um, so there are some comments about the resurrection of the body. Okay, that's a, that's a tough one, isn't it? Okay. I remember when I was younger, I did not understand this at all. I thought, I thought you know, our bodies are going to be raised up. I didn't have the slightest idea about that. So I remember, I think I, that became clear to me when I was in seminary. I didn't know that until I was in seminary. Um, so then we get to the last, the last little clause in the creed, and we believe the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. So life everlasting. Uh, we talk about our particular judgment. So the time in which we go before the Lord, when we die, we go before the Lord to be judged. So every one of us upon our death, then receive, then we enter into our particular judgment in which the Lord then determines whether or not we've lived a life in union with him. Um, for those that have, uh, for those that have lived their life in union with God, with love of God and putting that love into practice, especially through our care of our neighbor. Um, so then for them, they go to heaven to see God face to face. Heaven is a share in the perfect life of the Trinity. Um, so God who is hidden from us and who is beyond our comprehension, then will be revealed to us that we will see, behold the Lord face to face. And then we shall be changed as a result of that. First John talks about the idea that when we behold him face to face, then we ourselves shall be, or St. Paul mentions that, that we shall be changed. Um, uh, when we when we behold him and this is described as the beatific vision so to behold God so the blessed vision the beatific vision which is to look upon God face to face in the Old Testament they said if you look at God if you were to see God you would die well this now becomes the moment at which we are then um, we can spend all of eternity beholding our beloved so seeing our beloved seeing the object the ultimate object of our desire which is to be with God and then we behold that for all of eternity Heaven's described in many different ways. Sometimes it's described as a wedding feast, and so we wait to be welcomed into the great wedding feast of the Lamb, uh, the wedding feast in which the bridegroom has come to, to, to marry his bride. And who is the bride? We are the beloved. So, so it's kind of a, uh, a joyful wedding feast in which then we encounter our beloved Savior who has loved us and who has taken us to himself. And so we all become like the, the uh, not just a guest, at the, an accidental side guest at a wedding feast, but actually the, the one welcomed in in order to, um, to meet the, the lover and the beloved. Um, the, we hear um, St. Paul say that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and the heart of man has not yet conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. So heaven itself, like the resurrection of the body, heaven is a mystery. I can't tell you what heaven will be like. It's beyond any of our comprehension. Um, sometimes we might think, well, won't we get bored? You won't get bored. <laughs> so, but people say, oh, that's all we're going to do? Well, yeah, okay, no, it's, well, don't, don't knock it. So that's okay. But no, it's the, um, this, God is the um, greatest desire for which the human heart longs. Um, we get occupied with other desires here below, but fundamentally the greatest thing that brings us the most peace and contentment is the Lord and to behold the object, the ultimate object of our desires, the greatest of joys. 
Uh, for those that have not yet um, been sufficiently purified, uh, who need to yet be purified of some of the stain of sin before entering paradise, then there is purgatory or a place of purification. Um, so I think we, we talked about some of these things, I think, when we were talking about All Saints and All Souls Day. So, um, so we've already talked a little bit about purgatory. Um, purgatory itself, so yes, it is a place of purification, so with a certain amount of suffering, but not um, like the suffering of hell. So the suffering of purgatory is hopeful because everyone, once purified, then goes into heaven. And whereas the suffering in hell is, is hopeless without any hope, um, so uh, being a, a permanent separation from God. So hell and purgatory are completely different things. Uh, purgatory is a sign of mercy, um, that the Lord gives us the opportunity, if not yet sufficiently purified here below, to, to yet be purified um, of any of our weakness or sin. Um, hell, on the other hand, however, is a consequence of sin. <clears throat> and sin is a free choice. We have free will, and if we choose to disobey the Lord, then we choose to sin. So hell is not something that we fall into by accident. It's something that is the result of our choice. Um, if we choose to reject God and rejecting God, remember that we can sometimes also reject him by rejecting our neighbor with whom God associates. Remember the, the, the uh, particular judgment that happens or the general judgment that happens when the Lord comes in glory and separates the sheep from the goat, goats. So that's like the general judgment. He comes in glory and now all of the souls appear before him and he separates them out and, and what's the criterion on which he separates them so as often as you gave drink to the thirsty or food to the hungry and clothed the naked as long as you did these for the least of your neighbors you did this for me and if you didn't do that then you didn't do that for me so Adla and I said oh well I would never want to displease the Lord but if we displease the Lord in displeasing or in rejecting um, other people then that's a very dangerous place to be um, so that's part of the consequence there is have we loved God and in particular have we loved him in our neighbor. Um, hell is described by Jesus as an unquenchable fire. Philosophically we could say we've been made for God and to be permanently separated from God is in fact the greatest punishment. Um, so uh, hell itself is, is an eternal punishment. Um, these are not very pleasant things to, to uh, contemplate or to think about. Um, and it's for this reason that we want to try to do everything we can to avoid um, that fate. Um, we, there's the passage that says that uh, strive to enter by the narrow gate. So look for the narrow gate, look for that narrow path. Wide is the path that leads to damnation and many follow, many choose to follow it. So that's, that's a, a, so, uh, an image that Jesus uses in the gospels. Um, and so oftentimes we kind of look for the path of least resistance. That's the path that leads to, to perdition or to damnation said, strive for that narrow path. So strive for excellence, strive for greatness. Um, seek out the Lord and know that it's not that, and seeking the Lord oftentimes means not choosing the easy path, but in effect doing that which is right, and especially when it's difficult. So that's, that's the path that leads to life. Um, so those are images that Jesus uses to, to phrase that, to put that, that point to us about making our choices. So, it's, so be careful about the choices that we make. So we want to um, choose to serve God, um, to live a life of holiness, to avoid sin. So what leads us to hell? Mortal sin, um, but also rejecting God's love. So the not, not accepting his mercy or forgiveness, not calling upon him or asking for it. What leads to heaven, what leads to a life of Christ is loving the Lord, loving the Lord and our neighbor, avoiding sin. So it's a combination both of the positive, we want to love the Lord, and the negative, we want to avoid things that would be sinful. If we do the opposite, if we don't love the Lord, and if we choose the things that are sinful, that's what puts us in that most precarious position of potentially going to hell. Don't go to hell. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes people say, like, they, the, uh, they use that expression casually or something like that. So, you know, so someone should just go to hell. Well, anyway, that's a, I know it's kind of a casual statement, but that is far from a casual, has far from casual significance. So, so I say, don't go to hell. Words to live by. Okay. So if you remember, if you remember that one there, just remember that, write that one down and there's your word for the day. Okay. Don't go to hell. Okay. So, um, and then finally, the last judgment, we say Christ will come again. 
um, not just at our particular judgment when we go before the Lord, but when the Lord finally comes at the end of time on that last day, the dead shall be raised, and then there will be the final judgment. And this is not only the separation of the sheep and the goats, but also the beginning of Christ's reign, and there will be a new heaven and a new earth, which is the renewal of everything that's been created. It will be recreated. So there's a recreation. How will that happen? I don't know. Um, so, but it will be a marvel to behold. We know that all creation right now is subject to futility or corruption. Um, a, a physicist, do I have physicists here? We call that entropy. So entropy is, in fact, the tendency of things to become disorganized. So order requires energy. The universe naturally tends toward disorder. Entropy would be the scientific way of stating a theological uh, sense, which is that all creation is subject to decay. Not so after the renewal of the heavens and the earth. So when the new heavens and new earths are recreated, now everything will be set free from corruption. So not just simply our bodies, but everything else that God has made. Um, you, we have the sense that um, in the Garden of Eden, remember that Adam and Eve were situated in the garden and God came into the garden and walked with them. Well, then we lost God because of sin, and so God became distant from us. But now, in this recreation, then, then finally we have this new and heavenly Jerusalem, and God will dwell with us. So it's God dwelling among us. It's like a recreation of the Garden of Eden. Except in this case, instead of calling it Eden, the scriptures use the phrase of the new Jerusalem. So, so, we have, so it has that new name. But then the temple and the heart of the city will be the Lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world will be there. So God will dwell with us, that we will behold him, he will behold us, and now there is no longer any distance uh, between us. And so that is the, uh, the joy for all eternity. And at the end of the creed we say amen which is a way of saying this is true. We affirm that, yes, this is what we believe. So that word amen, um, it, that word amen is a personal statement of, of confirming. We might say, I'm confirming everything that I just said. So, um, so through Christ our Lord, amen. So that's, so that's the, the, confirm, the confirming statement uh, of our, of our uh, act of belief. So with that, we conclude the creed. And if you've seen the, the uh, schedule and our topics, the next thing from there is actually to, to get started on the liturgy and the sacraments. And we, uh, when we talk about the sacraments, you might then say to yourself, you say, okay, well, the sacraments, okay, well, yep, I know what we're talking about there. So if, and there are seven sacraments all together. So we think about baptism and confirmation and Eucharist and penance and anointing of the sick and holy orders and matrimony. Okay, well, we, yes, we'll get into all of those. But before we actually get into any one sacrament, um, there are some things that we can talk about just about the liturgy in general. And that's what we'll spend the remainder of this time just talking about the liturgy and, um, and the sacraments in general without getting into any specific one. Remember, let me take a step back to say, remember when we were looking at the um, structure for the catechism, it comes with four pillars. So the first pillar was the creed, and it answers the question, what do we believe? The second pillar was going to be the seven sacraments, and that answers the question, how do we worship? So how do we pray to God? How do we worship God? The third pillar becomes the Ten Commandments, and that's then how do we live? So how should we live in this life? And then finally, the Our Father is the pillar about our spiritual life or about our prayer. So how is it that we should pray? So the creed flows into the sacraments because what we believe is now going to inform the way in which we worship. And this is actually one of the, the neat things about the liturgy. Um, so the liturgy is kind of a, a very generic word that refers to any act of worship or prayer. In a broad sense, we can say all of that falls under the category of liturgy. Um, the thing that's interesting about that is liturgy is always reflecting our belief. It's, re it's reflecting what we believe about God. But the initiative for liturgy doesn't just come from us. So it's God that invites us to worship him. So liturgy is always something that's coming from God, and then it becomes our response, our response according to God's will. It's our participation in the work of God. What happens throughout the, uh, throughout the entire history of salvation, as the Bible tells these very stories, and different historical events and different people who come and go in the telling of the story, God is at work. So God is at work manifesting his majesty or his mercy. So God is working in our world. 
and we in the liturgy participate in the works of God. So now, this is all kind of very high level the way that I'm describing this. This is some of the language in the catechism. But in the greatest of all the works that God has accomplished is the Paschal mystery, and that was Jesus's passion, death, and resurrection. And that Jesus told us to do in memory of him when they gathered at the Last Supper. So we were told to repeat what he did, and that's our participation or our sharing in his work. So who was it that did the work? That's Jesus Christ, the, did the work of the Paschal mystery. So what do we do? We do what he tells us to do, and we are sharing in that work. So there, that's, that's why I used that expression a moment ago, that the liturgy is our participation in the work of God. So ultimately, God is the one who accomplishes all that is good, um, and we do our part. Liturgy is, you might say, a public work, meaning it's the work of the people. It's what we do. It's our action or activity to worship God, but it's also God's work. God is the one who is acting as well. And so by do, what we do, we do in the Lord. So it becomes an action done in God. Um, we, I've used the expression before to talk about, um, did we talk about Jesus Christ, priest, prophet, and king? I, I, we brought that up in the church, with respect to the church, that's right. So the section on the church got into those things. Um, well, worship itself is also a priestly, prophetic, and kingly action. So we can use those same three images <clears throat> Jesus, priest, prophet, and king. It's priestly because it's a liturgical action. It's a sanctifying action. That's what priests do in celebrating the sacred rites. So it's priestly. It's prophetic because it depends on the word of God. And so the word of God is announced. And so it's teaching and prophetic in nature. So it also tells us things about what we believe. And it's kingly. And remember the way that Jesus Christ is king. He's king through service. So service always becomes that expression of the kingly role. So the liturgy itself is a sanctifying action that is priestly in nature. It's a prophetic action that's teaching in nature. And it's a kingly action that's also built around service. It's always um, focused around service. Um, every action, every liturgical act is an act of Jesus Christ, the head and high priest, um, with the rest of the body of Christ also participating. Remember, in that image of that mystical body, Christ is the head and we are the members. So every liturgical action is an action of Jesus Christ, the head, but in which the members of the body also take part. So we have an active part in every liturgical action, and so does Christ. So Christ is acting and we're acting. Um, it's, uh, and that's one of the reasons why, so any liturgy, like the Mass, for example, I, I've used this, I, I think when we were taught, when I was try, trying to encourage people about coming back to Mass, I was kind of saying, now remember, this is not like just going to watch a movie. You're not just a passive recipient, as though, oh, there's all that action taking place up there, and I'm just an observer. I'm just sitting back observing, so I don't really have anything to say about this. So just, I'm just admiring it. I'm taking it in. Okay. That's not the case with the liturgy. It's a little bit more like live theater in the sense that a lot of times when people are in live theater, they would say the audience is there and the actors will feed on that. I mean, there's the, the actors will respond to the applause or the laughter or the, or the um, they, they will draw energy from the crowd. If anyone's ever been involved in theater, that is a very real experience. So there it's a two, di two dimensional or two directional uh, communication that's there. But even that isn't good enough because the idea that we are all participants in this liturgical action, Christ the head and then the members of the body, um, it's more than us just sitting back in the audience watching and responding to the actors on the stage. No, we ourselves are act acting. We are the ones also acting by taking full and active participation. That's a great phrase that was used in Vatican II. So we take part in this as well. So we're not just simply receiving or standing back, but we're the ones also offering up our prayers in union with the priest who takes the place of Christ the head. So the, when, when you have the celebrant or the, the priest celebrant, there is the person leading the liturgical action who stands in the place of Christ, but we are with Christ at the same time, united with him in prayer. And so it's a, com it's a combined action between the head and members, between the celebrant and the congregation, between the, the ministerial priesthood and the common priesthood of the baptized or of the laity. We, we talk about we all share in Christ's priestly dignity. So 
the ordained as well as the lay faithful, united together and all of, all of us fulfilling our part and doing our role, not passively, but actively, so actively engaged. In fact, when we talk about the, um, the idea of having an active role, the, the last Sunday, um, this last Sunday, one of the songs, or recently we had the song, How Can I Keep From Singing? My life goes on an endless song. How can I keep from singing? And I, I said, so everyone please join in hymn number such and such. And what did everyone do? That hymnal just stood, stood right there in the pew. <laughs> and they, people did not pick And I said, what, what is the irony there? So, so please join me and perform your part in the liturgy by engaging in full and active participation by joining me in singing. How can I keep from singing? How, how, how um, ironic is it? that the song is how can I keep from singing quite easily apparently because <laughs> it, it seemed like no one was singing so so there's 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 an irony that we're not meant to just simply sit back and let everyone else do the work but no we're in we're invited to be engaged in that liturgy has a visible sign um, so we are engaged in visible actions we can see actions that are done this that becomes a sign of our communion with God through symbolic through symbols through actions and yet at the same time, it is also an invisible work because during the liturgy, we are encountering the Lord and this is something that's not exactly tangible. So we use tangible things to experience intangible realities. Um, the liturgy is a work of prayer, which means that the Holy Spirit is at work inspiring us to lift up our hearts and minds in prayer. So we raise our prayers up to the Lord through Jesus Christ to the Father. So it's, it's in the Holy Spirit empowering us doing the work that Jesus Christ is, is, do, is accomplishing within us in the liturgy for the glory of the Father. It's a Trinitarian work, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Liturgy, the liturgy is catechetical. It teaches us. We learn from the liturgy. By going through the experience of the liturgy, we learn about who Jesus Christ is and who we are and what our relationship is to be with him. The experience of participating in the liturgy is an instructional experience. It's not like a classroom. It's not like a textbook. It's like something you participate in, and by participate, you, you learn in the doing. And so we can spend time talking about it, but there's also some things. It's, like, it's, it's kind of like if you were to learn to play a sport, and then the coach says, okay, we're ready. We're now ready to, to talk about playing football. Okay, everyone get out your notebooks. Okay, first I'm going to give a two-hour lecture. <laughs> Okay, that's it. And if all the coach did was just talked about what's going to happen, and then you didn't actually do that, you, what do you know about playing football? It doesn't that that doesn't make any sense? You have to get out on the field and actually then um, practice by doing. And the, the liturgy is something that we have to do in order to really fully understand. We learn in that in the doing, um, expressing both a visible and an invisible reality. Um, the, for the sacraments themselves, there's, there's really a great part of the catechism that talks about in detail about the way in which the sacraments are a work of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And this, it's, it's kind of a dense, it's a beautiful, um, it's dense, but it's also a very beautiful sentiment that's there. And I'll just maybe really briefly say something about that. It's, that the Father is the one who is both the author of everything that happens in the sacraments and in the liturgy, and he is the goal toward which the sacraments and the liturgy are all directed. So everything is comes from the Father, and it, it goes back to praise the Father, just as Jesus came from the Father and then returned everything to the Father. So one of the things that the Father does um, throughout all of the Old Testament is he blesses. He gives blessings. The idea of blessings, the idea that there is a blessing imparted in the liturgy or in the sacraments, that's, that's actually a really important thing. So may Almighty God bless you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that there is actually a blessing giving, given. This is a free gift, and throughout all of history, from Adam and Eve to Noah to Moses to Abraham to David to all of the prophets, we can say the Lord gives blessings. He gives blessings that are free, so they're not earned. They are total gift, so it's a gift that is given. Um, you might say in spite of even their sinfulness, that in spite of their unworthiness, God goes out of his way to pour out his blessings. And the sacraments are extensions of what the Father has always been doing, which is to give a blessing, his divine blessing that's given out in the liturgy. And the greatest blessing that Jesus poured out onto the world was his son, 
Jesus Christ who entered into the world, and so Jesus Christ also is important at the heart of the sacraments. Where do the sacraments all come from? They come from the words and actions of Jesus Christ. So the sacraments themselves were not made up by the church as if the church then decided, well, hmm, this sounds like this would be a nice sacrament to have. And we would say that the church has received them from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the author of every sacrament. Every sacrament we have comes from the fact that Jesus Christ himself has done and said certain things that have instituted specific sacraments. In particular, the most obvious one, the Eucharist. Jesus gathers them at the Last Supper and he does these actions with bread and with wine and he tells them, do this in memory of me. There's the clearest instruction um, or almost the clearest instruction I guess we, we could have about a sacrament, maybe a close second, um, was uh, before Jesus ascends to heaven, he tells the disciples, go out and, te and baptize, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. A clear command given by Jesus to baptize people, to bring them to faith and to salvation. But the other sacraments then as well, we would say that they find their origin in Jesus Christ and what he has done. The um, Paschal mystery itself, Jesus' death and resurrection, is the ultimate source of grace given to the world. It is a past event, but in a mysterious way, and this is the power of the sacraments, is that by our participation in the sacraments of the church, we are experiencing the power of that same passion, death, and resurrection in our present day. This is really a mysterious thing to contemplate because it's not that Jesus is being crucified again and again and again and again, so that way we can experience the fruits of it. And he was crucified once and for all, so in that one moment, and then he overcame that in his resurrection. But mysteriously, through the, sac through the sacramental graces that we receive, when we uh, participate in the Mass, we are benefiting from and participating in that one sacrifice. Um, so there's, there's time travel happening. So, oh, see, it's a, ooh, okay, a little time travel happened there. So here, the, you can say with past events, we can never go back into the past to experience the signing of the Declaration of Independence. No, I mean, we can talk about it, we can imagine it, we could reenact it, but it's not the same. Not so with the sacraments. With the sacraments, we are sharing in that past event in a real, mysterious, spiritual, sacramental way. Um, and so Jesus then working through the apostles and through their successors as Jesus chose the apostles and commissioned them and sent the Holy Spirit upon them. And, um, and so the Jesus continues to remain them, with them and with the church and remains with them in a particular way in the earthly liturgy, in the liturgies that we celebrate, the sacraments we celebrate, and also unites them with the heavenly liturgy. So there's uh, the book of Revelation kind of has these wonderful des descriptions of the heavenly liturgy. And so somehow we are caught up in this, um, in between heaven and earth, in which by our prayer, our prayers go up to the Lord. And so we have a share in, almost a foretaste of the heavenly liturgy um, in the temple, in the heavenly temple that would be described um, in particular in the book of Revelation and, and elsewhere in the Bible as well. So Jesus in heaven is not distant from us. He's close to us, closer than we could imagine, especially through the sacraments. And so he participates. He, he is still united with us in our earthly liturgies here below. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit helps us, uh, helps strengthen our faith. So the faith that then helps us to benefit from the sacraments we receive. Um, the Holy Spirit then draws us, prepares us to encounter Jesus Christ, just as so many of the things that happened in the Old Testament. So they were, they were symbolic actions, and they prepare the way for something in the New Testament. So we talk about walking through the Red Sea. Um, as, the, as the Hebrews pass through the Red Sea with the waters like a wall on their right and on their left. And that then helps us to understand later something like the sacrament of baptism, in which we pass through waters to be set free, not from slavery to the Egyptians, but to be set free from slavery to sin. We can say, see, we were prepared by an Old Testament story, an Old Testament um, uh, event, to understand a New Testament reality. The Passover celebration that Moses prepared helps us to understand later than the Last Supper that Jesus celebrated. And the Holy Spirit is constantly doing that. The Holy Spirit is teaching us, preparing us, helping us to better understand and to fruitfully participate in 
um, this act of communion with Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit is present in when we hear the word of God proclaimed, reading our hearts. Um, the Holy Spirit is present um, in, uh, in symbolic form, especially symbols that are drawn from the Old Testament, um, in helping us to recall and to understand uh, what Jesus Christ has done and the significance of that, opening the door of faith to our deeper understanding. And the Holy Spirit is present to, it comes to make Jesus present. This is another, um, so it's not just acting in a merely spiritual way within our hearts, but remember that how, how was it that Mary conceived um, Jesus in her womb? He says, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit descended upon Mary. She was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit and Jesus was conceived within the womb of the Virgin Mary. So the Holy Spirit brought Jesus into Mary's womb. There's a point at the mass when we call down the Holy Spirit, and you'll see the priest put his hands out and the servers ring the bell, unless they forget. Okay, they, okay. no, they're pretty good. They're pretty, they're, they're pretty good about this. Call it, put, places his hands out. It's called the, epi, uh, the epiclesis. It just means the calling down. The priest calls down the Holy Spirit because just, <clears throat> Excuse me, just as the Holy Spirit was instrumental in bringing Jesus down into the womb of the Virgin Mary, so also the Holy Spirit is effective in bringing Jesus down into the sacrament on the altar. So as we talk about the bread being transformed into the body of Christ, <coughs> so also the Holy Spirit takes, uh, takes part in that action as well. Um, so those are just a few things about the way in which the Holy Spirit is, is active and present in those things. <coughs> so we, uh, I mentioned a little bit ago that um, the sacraments all acquire their effectiveness from Jesus' words and actions. So what Jesus says and what he does, this is, this is, so he heals the sick, we have the sacrament of anointing. He, um, he, for example, changes water into wine at the wedding feast of Cana. That's oftentimes looked at as an important sign of the sacrament of uh, matrimony. He ordains the apostles at the Last Supper, holy orders. Uh, he sends forth the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And so there you have a confirmation. So we can look at different examples of where Jesus acts with respect to each of the sacraments, and that becomes its origin. That's, a, that's an aspect of the origin of each sacrament. But here's the interesting thing about the sacraments, is that they all require the, um, the speaking of a word, and it's the word that causes them to become effective. This is really a big deal. Um, stop and think about this. So let's say that you want to construct a chair. You're going to make a chair. Okay. And so you say, so you say, I'm going to say, I'm going to now make this chair. Let there be a chair. Okay. And what happens? Nothing. Okay. <laughs> because until you actually physically pick up the elements that make the chair and put them together and fashion the chair, then the chair comes to be. We are so used to having to physically do something. So you say, well, the house is dirty. Let the house be clean. And it was clean. No, no, no. You got to push the vacuum and the vacuum has to go. And so you have to labor. We're so used to having to labor on things to accomplish them. But remember in the beginning of creation. So what was it that God said? Let there be light. And there was light. So this is, so God can accomplish things simply by a word. And the sacraments actually work very much the same way. So when Jesus, for example, forgives sins, and he, he says, your sins are forgiven, the word that he says causes the effect. It doesn't, it, it, work, it doesn't work that way almost in any respect for us. We have to labor on things to, to bring about an effect, but not for God. The word causes the effect. When the word is said, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and with the pouring of water. So I guess there is, there is, an, there is another action that corresponds with that. But the words themselves cause the baptism to take place. Baptism is conferred. The priest in confession says, I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and your sins are absolved. The priest takes the host and says, this is my body, 
which will be given up for you. And, and, the, and the change takes place. The, the consecration takes place. And so with the other sacraments as well. So there's, so the word is spoken and it takes effect. This is, that's really a powerful thing. And especially because so often it's connected with Jesus's word, which was effective. So what Jesus says became effective. And so the same thing happens then with the sacraments. So this power, it comes from Christ and it's been entrusted by the church. And so the church receives it as a gift, like the deposit of faith, like I said before, a gift that's given to the church. So the church continues to safeguard that, um, that gift and um, to protect it. And so it's not for the church to somehow redefine the sacraments. No, they've been created by Jesus Christ. The church is to safeguard the sacraments. Um, and then to entrust the carrying out of the sacraments to those ministers or to those in the ministerial priesthood who then, um, who then carry out those sacraments in the name of the church. Um, so the sacraments are there to nourish our faith, to help us by prayer, to accomplish the work of salvation, to, to, that they become effective by their very work, by their celebration, and they lead us to eternal life. Um, so that's an important, it's an important aspect of the sacraments. Um, I mentioned before that the sacraments themselves are an expression of Christ the head and members. So we all have an active part, that we all take part in the celebration of those sacraments. So in a particular way, we can say that a priest is the celebrant of most of the sacraments, but in another sense, we can say that, that all of the faithful are also celebrants or sharing in the celebration of the sacraments. So I offer prayers at Mass, but that doesn't mean that you're not supposed to also pray. So you offer up your prayers. So you offer up your prayers in union with the priest's prayers. And so it's actually through that joint participation that the sacrament becomes most effective. Um, that it has its greatest effect. It's um, when we ourselves are engaged in that. Much like Christ is the bridegroom and the church is the bride, so it's in the union of those two. So the priest stands in the place of Christ the head. Um, we are the, the, everyone else there stands in the place of the church as the bride of Christ and in that love between the two. Um, so there we have a, um, a great gift in the effectiveness of the sacraments. Um, sacraments themselves, um, they are incarnational, so they take place using signs and symbols, using ordinary objects like water or bread or wine or oil, um, different, different things that are used from visible, ordinary aspects of creation, but they take on an extraordinary aspect because of an invisible aspect of the sacraments because of God's grace. God's grace is conferred in those sacraments using ordinary visible things to communicate an invisible reality. Um, and so we talk about this, the sacraments as being outward signs instituted by Christ to give grace. It's a, it's a great um, image that is used earlier on. Um, and then as we continue on and, and talk about the liturgy themselves, we can talk about the different elements of the liturgy. And this is where, this is something we'll probably have to then defer until we get into later times where we talk about the liturgical year, we've got celebrations that are part of our liturgy, we're getting ready to start Advent, um, and so as we go throughout the year we have different celebrations, different ways in which we enter into the um, expression of this mystery, um, different ways in which we pray, um, the, the different prayers that the church recites, even the, the places and the, and the place where we pray. The church itself is actually filled with important elements that assist us in our prayer. And later on, when there's a church tour, as we can point things out, there are things that you've seen before, but to talk about their significance. So they all help us in the work of prayer. So the altar is there for a reason, and the ambo is there for a reason, and, and so forth. Um, so all of the different elements that we use um, in the church itself um, that help us in the celebration of the sacraments, um, including even other sacramentals and other objects we use for veneration. So we use holy water, um, we use um, decorations, we have crosses, we have statues, images of saints, even veneration of relics, other religious objects, even things that people will wear or carry about with them, devotionals that they practice. These are all parts of this um, liturgical action that help us to enter into a spirit of prayer. So. Um, there's a lot more that can be said about the liturgy, but given the time that we have, that's a good, I think, introduction. <coughs> Excuse me. And at least a way to get us started. 
So, uh, so that's the, uh, a touch of the liturgy. We'll get into the individual sacraments the next time that we meet. Um, next week would be Thanksgiving, so we actually will take the week off. So don't come next week, the day before Thanksgiving, be with your families. So, so no class next Wednesday. But then the following Wednesday after that, then we'll start with baptism and confirmation. And so we'll be back two weeks from today and then delving into those two specific sacraments. By that time, we'll be entering into the throes of, of Advent and, and preparing ourselves for Christmas. So we look forward to that. So, um, so we can call upon the Mother of God as we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And then we talked about blessings. You should probably get a blessing. So the Lord be with you and with your spirit. So and this is the gift of the Father. As we say, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Okay.